Okay, uh, let me um, start off with a brief introduction of who I am. For those who don't know me, uh, uh, my family and I, we've only been in New England about 15 years now. Uh, I grew up in the South. I uh, grew up in Mississippi. Uh, spent the first 20 years of my life there and moved to Oklahoma and went to graduate school at OU. And after that, moved to Texas and stayed there 20 years uh, before coming to New England. And I need to let you know, I had never had an interest in coming to New England. Uh, I fought it tooth and nail. I'm only here because my wife was offered a job uh, in Boston. Uh, then as she and I began to wrestle with that and talk about that, and then I actually came up here and did a, a, a visit for a weekend, uh, then I began to soften my attitude uh, toward that. Yeah, you fell in love with us. Uh, no, I didn't fall in love with you. Uh, <clears throat> but because I loved my wife and wanted to encourage her in her professional pursuits, uh, that's the reason we're here. Now, for a whole year, I lived in Houston, and she and our son were here in, in uh, New England. And so every now and then, I would come, uh, fly in for a week or for a couple of weeks or whatever. Uh, we had a house in Texas that somebody had to be there to sell. And so I was there, plus uh, I was involved in full-time ministry there. And so I had some work to finish up with the congregation that I was involved with there. And eventually, I uh, came here. And uh, I have enjoyed the time that I've been in New England. It is a cultural shock uh, for somebody who's grown up in the South and somebody who is used to heat, uh, not brutal winters. Uh, but we have adjusted and got some winter clothes and all that kind of good stuff and gotten a snowblower. Uh, and so we, 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 uh, we, are, we are finding our way. Uh, but I'm a Southerner at heart. I did not grow up in the Church of Christ. I grew up in a Baptist church, and my wife Lynn introduced me to the Church of Christ. So uh, you could say she was uh, my teacher at the very beginning, and praise be to God, I am now her teacher. Uh, but it, uh, it was a joyful learning experience as she taught me the fundamentals of the faith. Now, uh, even though I was not a part of the Church of Christ, I was a devoted churchgoer. Uh, so it wasn't like I was ignorant of scripture, uh, I have been involved in some type of church work since I was about 12 or 13. And so as I look at myself and look at my, my skill set, leadership and administration are at the forefront of the things I love to do. Uh, I can do it with my eyes closed. And, and second to that is teaching. And so I'm very thankful for the opportunity to come and, and be a part of uh, this retreat this year. Uh, and I'm hoping that something will be said in the presentation that will be helpful to all of us. Now, uh, when Danny and I had our initial conversation about how we we're going to do this, uh, one of the reasons we had the conversation is that we didn't want to duplicate what the other person was going to be saying. And so when you invite multiple speakers and, and really there's no clarity on the presentation, uh, and some of you have been at places where you end up with people saying some of the same things. And so we wanted to make sure that there was, there was a good flow and that things were building on one another. And so Danny has laid the biblical foundation. Uh, he's given a scripture to what it means to be a biblical man. And that starts with trusting God and obeying God and standing even uh, when it does not appear to be popular or when you don't really see a way out. And we have to do that not only for ourselves, but for our families, uh, for the congregations that we lead. Uh, so the piece that I, I have for this first session is really to talk about mentoring. And so this is mentoring as it relates to our families, uh, mentoring also uh, in our churches. Uh, I believe that COVID-19 has done the church a major service. COVID showed us some things about ourselves that because we were traditionally doing some things, we didn't think anything of. Because everything was going uh, hunky-dory, uh, uh, we were on cruise control. And COVID came and just changed all of our worlds. And, and there's still some people whose world is still being altered as a result of that. And so from my perspective, COVID gave us an opportunity to, to really evaluate what is it we're doing, not only in our families, but what is it we're doing in our congregations. And I'm sure many of us have cut out some things in our congregations that we used to do prior to COVID. 
And part of that is because the people aren't there and we don't have as many opportunities to do, that, uh, do those kinds of things. But what about things that are going on in our home? So, so COVID showed us, from my perspective, uh, uh, two or three things. One is that our people are not as spiritual as we thought they were. They were churchgoers, but the church wasn't in them. And so they were coming to Bible class, but they weren't living the Bible. I, I, so I remember when COVID first started, I had Bible school teachers who were telling me long before mandates came, well, I'm, I'm not going to be teaching Bible class anymore. Uh, and I'd ask them why. Well, COVID is coming. I said, yeah, uh, so? And so I have to say, I, I, I have a bachelor's degree in biology. Uh, and I have a master's degree in health administration. So, so I, I know a little bit about viruses and bacteria and stuff like that. Uh, and so I was trying to help educate people to stop being so fearful Amen. and exercise your faith. Uh, I have an underlying health condition, like many of you probably do. And so that didn't deter me from standing strong in my faith. And, and so it, I believe COVID helped us to see that our people are not as spiritual as we thought they were. They're good people. Uh, they're honest people. But they're not people whose faith matches up with what they say. We, we're good at giving good Bible answers, uh, but we don't always live those good Bible answers. And then one of the other things that was very clear to me is that we, we, we have leaders who don't know how to lead. We have leaders who are managers. So when COVID came, you need a leader. You need somebody who could chart out what we need to do and not somebody who was hiding behind weak church members. And if we're not careful, we're not going to learn those lessons and we will continue to have men who are managers, not leaders, not shepherds. And so from my perspective, one of the things that we need to do is really think about the importance of mentoring and developing new and future leaders. Uh, but also uh, in our families, mentoring our wives and our children also in the faith. Because they look to us for guidance. And, and so we need to be there to guide them. Uh, which means our faith needs to be intact. And so it's from those kind of ideas that I put together this presentation uh, today. So I want to, before I begin, I want to find out who am I talking to. Uh, so how many ministers in the house? Okay, that's always a bad sign. Okay, <laughs> how many elders are in the house? Okay, how many deacons? Okay, how many Bible school teachers? Uh, I know we got a lot of song leaders up in here. Okay, and then the rest of us are just good church-going brothers, right? Yeah. All right, good. So, so I want to share a few things here. Uh, these are what I believe are some false assumptions that we've had in the past. Uh, we have believed that men would stay faithful simply because they attended worship services. I think all of us know we have some brothers who attend our worship services that are not faithful. They're, they're, they're good men, you like them, but they're not faithful to God. Uh, we, have, we have seen that the way we function in the, in the past, it was as, as if we did not believe Bible class attendance was important. What I mean by that, and I, maybe this may not happen at your congregation, but I've been to many congregations where there are many brothers who are always in the hallway, in the parking lot, and drinking coffee uh, during Bible class time. But they end up leading us. Uh, and so I don't know about you. I, I believe Bible class attendance is paramount if you're going to lead God's people. Amen. You can't lead spiritual people when the people in the leadership are not spiritual. When it's come to selecting leaders, many times we've let financial prominence make our decisions for us. So a person who has a good job, make good money, who give, give generously, uh, we automatically assume they'll be a good leader. Well, why would you assume that? Well, I know, because they put a lot of money in the plate. The problem is, many times, those are some of the very people who, when things don't go their way, uh, then you have issues with them. So in mentoring, our goal is to help people to be more and more like Jesus. So in our homes, we ought to want our spouses and our children to be more and more like Jesus. 
And we've already established, based on the lessons that Danny has given to us, that's our job. So whereas Lynn may have taught me the gospel, once I understood the gospel and I started growing in the faith, uh, she could not lead, continue to lead me. And I call myself God's man. Now, those of you who know Lynn, you know she's a very strong Christian woman. And, and Lynn is a PK. She's a, she's, a, she's a daughter of a preacher. And so she was solid uh, when I first met her. And she still is solid. I think I made a little bit more solid. And so there, there are three passages that I just want to give a shout out to at the very outset. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Uh, Colossians 4.19, and I know many of you got your Bible, so I'm going to ask somebody to read those for us. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1, you ought to know that by memory. What does it say? Imitate me as I imitate Christ, or so follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, as a leader, we ought to be able to say that. As a leader, we ought to be able to say that to our families, uh, to the congregations that we lead, to the Bible classes that we teach, or whatever small groups that we lead. Uh, we ought to be able to say to them, follow me just like I'm following Jesus. Now, that means in order to be able to say that, you, you've got to be doing that. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, what does Paul tell Timothy? So one of, one of the thoughts that we pull from that is as fathers, one of the things that we ought to be doing with our children, in particular our sons, is letting them experience life with us. So as we do ministry, we ought to bring our children along. Now, as a given that we're going to do that with our spouses, but we ought to get our children involved early on so that they are connected and committed to what we believe. Uh, when we were in Houston, uh, Sebastian, our son, who's now 22, he used to go door knocking with us when he was about four or five. We were going to leave him at home. Uh, we were gonna leave, weren't going to leave him with the babysitter. We wanted him to see what his mother and father are doing on Saturday mornings. And little children like getting involved in church stuff. So we let him carry the tracks and carry the flyers and stuff like that. And every now and then, we let him be the first one to knock on the door. Now, because of those activities and others, he's connected to the church today. So we don't have to wait till our children become preteens and teenagers to get them involved. We can get them involved as soon as possible. And if we understand that with our families, then we can also understand that when it comes with the church house, that we need to be looking for individuals, brothers, that are faithful, that love God, that we can then pour ourselves in and teach who would then do the same thing with others. I think uh, uh, Danny mentioned discipleship in one of the lessons. We have lost the desire and the ability to disciple people. We baptize people and they start coming to church services. But in many places, we don't continue the one-on-one-ness that needs to occur with people. We just throw them in with everybody else and assume they're going, to, they're going to swim. And many times they're sinking, but we just don't know it. And so we have a lot of superficial church members because when they needed one-on-one -on -one teaching and training, we just put them in with the group. So I don't know about you guys, but it, when people that I work with, with personally in terms of teaching, I stay with them at least a year. At least a year. And if I see that, that, you know, it's just not clicking, then I'm going to be there even longer. Because I don't just want to baptize a person. I want them to be faithful. And so that takes a long time. Uh, people get excited on the front end. But what happens when problems and challenges come in their life? And many times we have not shown people how to deal with challenges and problems and still serve God. So I don't know if you guys have this problem, but I've experienced this when people, when bill collectors start getting out to people, uh, they get in debt, giving at the church suffers. A am I the only one who experienced that? And, and so my question to people is always, why, why do you think God's going to understand your shortchanging him? Why don't you think the car dealership or the cable people 
or the utility, why don't you think they'll understand? Because rare, rare is it that a car dealership would repossess your car after one payment. Or rare is they gonna shut the lights off if you miss one uh, payment. But people, our people are quick to start neglecting God over those kinds of things. And so to me, that's an area that shows we have some weaknesses, we have some discipleship, we have some mentoring that we need to focus on. Colossians 4, 19, who has that? Okay, 319. No, no, no. Uh, that's Galatians. Galatians 4.19? Okay. And so the idea Paul says to these Christians is, I'm going to stay with you until Christ is formed in you. I'm going to stay with you until Christ is formed in you, to where you start acting like him, you start thinking like him. It becomes automatic. And, and I use that verse to help us to begin to understand that it takes more than just coming to worship service, coming to a Bible class, singing uh, holy songs for Christ to be formed in somebody. And too many times that's what we have assumed will occur if people do those kinds of things. But we fail to realize people have a whole lot of distractions and challenges that come through their way uh, that many times hinder the process. And we need some people who have the insight to begin to look at behavior, observe what's happening with people, and recognize, okay, that's the person who needs some help. Uh, that's the person who needs some additional support. And surprisingly, even in our own family, sometimes we can miss that. Uh, we have children who are straight A's in school and all the kind of stuff, and we think that the straight A's academically will translate into, into sharpness spiritually. And it doesn't. Uh, we have children who are excellent in athletics and all the after school programs. And, and we will focus so much on that that we forget about their spirituality. To the extent you can raise a heathen in your house. So in the, in the scriptures, there, there are several examples of mentoring uh, in, in, in the Bible, and I just put a few there. And so I want to ask you, what, what do you think about what Jesus did with Peter? Now, you guys know Peter, and, and you know many times some, some things he said in the presence of Jesus and how Jesus had to uh, correct him. Anybody remember reading any of those things? Uh, Peter, Peter was famous uh, for this, I'm going to stay with you uh, regardless of who else departs from you. I'm willing to even go to jail and to die with you. But when the rubber came time to meet the road, that was not the case. And so Jesus even had to tell Peter on one occasion, you know, Satan has desired to sift you, but I prayed for you. And so even in that conversation with Peter, uh, he was not fully aware of what was happening with him. And I raise that issue simply to say that, that we have people who are being impacted by a whole lot of things. Their jobs, their education, uh, their family members, the environment that they live in, their best friends, and all that kind of stuff. And, and many times people don't understand that the pull in those things are greater on them than their commitment to God. And it shows up when certain decisions are made uh, that show that they prioritize other things over God. What kind of relationship did Barnabas have with Paul? What was Barnabas' relationship with Paul? Why did you say not good? Barnabas and Paul didn't get along? Right, 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 right. Okay. So, so one of the things that happens is 
A situation occurs where Barnabas goes and finds Paul and brings him to Antioch to work with him. And in Antioch, it is Barnabas and Paul. But after the son of encouragement works with him long enough, we normally refer to him as Paul and Barnabas. So as you're mentoring people and you're bringing them along, uh, sometimes they will have more prominence than you will. And we can't be jealous and insecure because we have trained someone, we taught them, and that they now are better at doing some things than we are. Because we ought to want to see God's best in people. And whoever God gifts to do that, we ought to be okay with that. I tell the people back home, I am looking forward to the time when God sends us another man at Bedford Street. Because when that occurs, I'm going to move into another role. I don't plan to preach until I die. I don't plan to preach until I'm falling over in the pulpit. And, and, and I think we, we would do well, those of us who are ministers, to recognize that there's a time for, to gracefully move on and bring in somebody else who can meet the challenges of leading the congregation. And you can be there to be an advisor and, and, advi and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but our congregations don't need to see us go down where our enthusiasm uh, is not what it was, and we're making excuses about why we can't do what we can do. Uh, remember, as a mentor, we're an example. Okay, I know you know about Paul and Timothy. What was significant about Paul's relationship with Timothy? What's that? He baptized him? Oh, what else? Okay, he's Paul's son in faith. He circumcised him. What else? Timothy was uh, a Okay, he was a disciple. What else? What's that? Okay, carry letters for him. So he was useful in the ministry that Paul was doing. Okay. Paul probably age wise was like Timothy's father as well. Right. Okay. Okay. So, what was Timothy's home life like? Okay, his mother and the grandmother trained him. His father was a Greek, which meant he wasn't a Christian. So, so you, you got a young man growing up in a home, mixed marriage, mother Christian, father not a Christian, but some kind of way, he stands out. You remember in Acts chapter 16, it talks about uh, Timothy was well thought of. And so somebody had been mentoring him and shaping him and helping to mold him into a servant of God. Okay, when you think about Jesus working with the 12, what do you think about there? When Jesus was working with mentoring the 12, what do you remember or see from those encounters? All right. Okay, so he was their teacher, he was their role model, uh, he was always trying to bring out the best in them. Okay, what else? They followed him around daily life. What's that? They followed Jesus around daily life. They followed Jesus on a regular daily basis. So they had an opportunity to see him involved in ministry. Uh, they not only saw him involved in ministry, but they also saw him deal with his critics. Mm -hmm. See, one of the things that we need to do a good job of role modeling for our family members and churchmen, how do you deal with the critics? Uh, it's easy to deal with the people who love you, who are always giving you gifts, who are inviting you over for dinner and stuff like that. But how do you deal with the critics? How do you deal, if you're a preacher, how do you, how do you deal with the folk who you know want you fired? If you're the minister, you're the elder, you're the teacher, how do you deal with people who just don't like you as a teacher and still keep on teaching, still keep on uh, preaching, and still keep on loving them when obviously they're not being loving toward you? So, so those are some of the areas that we rarely mentor and help people to understand how to deal with. But that's the reality. That's a part of ministry. You know, everybody's not going to like you. And we have to be able to recognize my service is to God. 
I'm serving the people, but ultimately my service is to God. And we can't get bogged down in that. What else? Okay. 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 So that's interesting because depending on what what gospel account you're reading, you will see that Jesus made several calls to these guys. And and part of that is there to help us understand that yes, they may have started out, but some of them went back. And you had to extend the call again. Uh, said differently, uh, as we are working to mentor people, some will backslide. You know, it's just like a drug addict. They're, good, they're going good for a month, two months, three months, whatnot, but then something happens and, and they go backwards. That does not mean they're not useful. That just mean they made a mistake. And we need to recognize, just like they have made a mistake, we have also made mistakes. And so we need to be thankful we weren't discredited from ministry because of a mistake or a couple of mistakes. And what do Jesus and mentors do when they just don't get it? Mm -hmm. When they didn't get it. They didn't get it. As a matter of fact, they really didn't get it until after he had died. Exactly. But then the Spirit moved and taught yep. them. Yes, the Holy Spirit. Well, they followed him. They were transformed by him. They joined in the mission. So it's a, a good thing to say. Okay. Okay. He challenged their faith. O oh, ye of little faith. O oh, ye of little understanding. Have, have I not been with you all this time? You, you will hear him say those kinds of things to remind them you're not, you're not observing what's before you. And a lot of that's a part of mentoring, uh, which is why mentoring takes patience, long-suffering. Uh, you have to consider that the investment I'm going to make in this person or these persons is worth it, even though I may be frustrated from time to time. I, okay. Um, Jesus had been concerned with their personal lives before they ever had any interaction with him outside of Christ. Or okay. So he cared about, he knew about them, uh, and he used that information to help them to be better. And so the more we know about a person that we're trying to mentor and develop, the greater we can tailor what we're doing to help them. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay, and, and I'll just add one other case. You remember the, when the, the James and John want to burn down the city? Because people didn't respond to the message the way they thought they were? Those are rough people that Jesus had to work with. Uh, and so many times when you look at the, when God does what only he could do with changing a, a man's heart, you begin to see God brings people from places we never thought people would go to. And that becomes a testimony to help people to understand God can use anybody. God can use anybody because there are some people who have done some things, been some places. And what, one of the ministries that I, I used to participate in when I was in Oklahoma was a prison ministry. And I've seen many examples of men and women who've been redeemed. Uh, but they had to go behind bars to, for God to get their attention. But he does get their attention and they do come out. Uh, they come out on the other side. So there, these are some things that I noted. 
about Jesus' relationship with uh, the 12. He taught them the truth with the right attitude. So as we're going to mentor and, and people, help them to understand how to use the truth of Scripture, but with the right attitude. Don't look down on people who don't know what you know about the gospel. Don't assume people don't love God because they're not a member of the Church of Christ. Recognize that we have been equipped so that we can go out and teach those persons. He was an example of what he was teaching them. So in spite of the, where the, uh, the disciples slash apostles were, Jesus upheld the Father's example for them. He gave them responsibilities, and he gave them feedback. So if we're going to mentor people, we're going to have to be willing to let go and let people do some things and give them an assessment or feedback on what they're doing. And we need to give realistic assessments and not be so concerned about, well, I don't want to hurt this person's feelings. In a training situation, the goal is to help this person to be whatever the standard is. And when we're talking about mentoring in Christ, we're talking about helping people become Christ-like. Anybody ever had a mentoring a, a relationship on your job? Yeah, an apprenticeship on your job? A lot of folk aren't concerned about your feelings. They're concerned about you learning the craft, learning the skill. And, and they want to qualify you so they're not wasting their time or their money on you. So he spent nearly three years working with these individuals. That's a lot of time uh, at, at, uh, in the first century. But mentoring takes time. It's not a one-time event or once a month kind of event and things like that. Think about mentoring your son or your daughters. That's a lifetime commitment. I want my son, long after he's left my house, to be able to come to his father and say, can you give me some advice? Not because he has to, but because he values and feels that I will steer him in the right direction based on what has happened over the past years. We need to have the same kind of relationship with those that we mentor. Uh, so we talked a little bit about Timothy. I just want to put this up there. Uh, Paul saw potential in Timothy. And so we need to be able to see potential in the individuals that we are ministering, that they can do whatever it is we're working with them to do. Paul, uh, Timothy, observed Paul. Let people shadow you. Let them spend, if you, if you are uh, doing visitation or some outreach activity, let some young person, some inexperienced person, or some young brother who you think has potential, let them go with you and see what real church work is about. Because many times people think church work is what we do on Sunday. Because we make such a fuss about Sunday. But what about the visitation that goes on during the week? What about the home Bible classes that go on during the week? Uh, what about uh, community activities and meetings that you go to? They need to see that that's a part of it also. So it's about more than just putting on a nice suit and getting up and doing a, a sermon on Sunday. And so we see Paul gave Timothy the opportunity to serve, as you guys mentioned other, earlier. Paul challenged Timothy in his weaknesses. Uh, Timothy was cowardly. He was timid. And Paul has to help him understand, you, you're not going to be successful at Ephesus being cowardly. You got to deal with some men who are teachers, who are in authority there, and you need to have the authority of the word of God, and you need to recognize, you need to conduct yourself in a certain way so they don't look down on your youth. So the goal of Christian mentoring is passing on the faith. So as we work with this person, we want them to be faithful. We want them to grow closer to God. The goal is to provide a flesh and blood example. We talk a lot about Bible characters. Uh, that's good. We talk a lot about the scriptures. That's good. But people need to see that what we're talking about can be done. Because people just think, well, this is only a, a select few people can do this. They need to recognize, no, you can do it also. But you got to make a commitment to God, and you got to prioritize what he said, going back to the, the presentation on Joshua this morning. you got to be courageous. Uh, you you got to stand even when it's not going to be convenient. And one of the things that we have to help young people to understand is you can't give in to peer pressure. Christians, we were created to be different. We embrace that. We don't hide from it. We don't uh, uh, dress like everybody else. 
uh, you, we, we, we're God's people. And there's a con- corresponding way that we live our lives, the way we make decisions, the way we conduct ourselves, all of those kinds of things. And we don't compromise that. And we have to help train them uh, so they begin to see this and help them to see how this, this works in real life situations. So I have never been a person who was fun when I had secular jobs of working on Sunday. As a matter of fact, I would tell a person in an interview, I don't work on Sundays. And if you want me to work on Sundays, it has to be between 12 and 3 o'clock. Because I'm going to be at morning service and I'm going to be at evening service. Because that's just what I believe I need to be. So one of the things I have done with my son is he's embraced the same idea. When he, he's an EMT uh, and he tells the people, I can't work on Sunday. Or if I have to work on Sunday, it's going to be after evening service, 8 or 9 o'clock at night. I want them to have Christian principles. I want them to have standards that don't change for a few dollars. And so we train people so that they can mentor other individuals who can mentor other individuals. Just going back to the Second, uh, second Timothy passage, uh, it is about training people, faithful men, who can then pass it on to others. And so one of the things that we've got to look at is, is this person faithful? Now, that's easy to determine when we're talking about our families because they're, they're in our households. Uh, we're leading them. We're guiding them. So we ought to know they're faithful because that's what we have been leading them into. And then as we work toward mentoring, we have to be open to seeing things from another person's perspective. So I go back again to my comments about COVID. COVID has helped us to see that there's more than one way to skin a rabbit. Because I'm sure most of us are streaming. Uh, Most of us have used Zoom or Facebook at some point in the course of all this uh, to get the word out, to keep our people connected. Things we would not have done prior to COVID because we we were focused around the building. And now... Uh, we now have created some avenues where, while we're still meeting at the building, we now have some outreach into the community where people can see us on those, in those spaces. That has helped us to be a little bit more evangelistic. It helped us raise the profile of the congregation in whatever community that we're in. And it's helped us to see that we can do things multiple ways and still honor God. So, as I prepare to conclude so you can have your free time, some things to ponder. Where will the next generation of leaders come from? If you 60, 70 years old, you ought to be thinking about this. Where where is the next set of leaders going to come? If you're 60, 70 years old, the bulk of your life is over. You're not going to have another 60 or 70 years. And in the context of the world we live in now, you could die tomorrow. Okay, what's going to happen to the congregation when you haven't prepared uh, any people to take your place? None of us, in spite of what we may think, are irreplaceable. But we don't plan like we are. So I share with you, I'm already trying to find uh, a situation where I can bring in a successor to take over uh, for me where I am. I think I I still got a few more good years in me, but I don't know that. Uh, But one of the things I want to do is help the congregation get used to the idea that one day you're going to have a preacher other than Maurice. Because our people will get used to one preacher, his style, and will reject everybody else as if something is wrong with them. And so one of the things that we have to be uh, aware of is that you need to expose your people to different teachers. And as a matter of fact, you don't need the next teacher or preacher to be just like you. The, next, the person who comes behind you needs to take this to the next level. Now, I know we have, we have focused a whole lot on just managing what we got. But you, get, but you got to take some risks. Now, not unwarranted risks. Not, not, we're not, not talking about gambling. But we ought not to be so comfortable with the status quo that we don't recognize we don't grow in the status quo. How many of your, of your young people are going to stay faithful after they graduate from high school or college? 
How many of the young people that you've invested in, who've grown up, been part of the youth group, and they go off to college and they don't come back? And you've invested all this time and resources in them, and they give the bulk of their Christian service uh, someplace else. Okay, uh, this one you'll be able to follow. Uh, I'm quite sure many of you have seen people ra get raised up in your congregation, you send them down south for colleges. And they don't come home. They get down there and the weather is nice. The cost of living is a whole lot simpler than New England. That was a, one of the big culture shocks, is how much it costs to live up here. So what are we doing? So I would encourage us, one of the things I try to do at our congregation is help our young people to understand we need you here. So yeah, go and get all the education you can, but come on back here and help serve the congregation. So sort of like jobs where people are on the job and they will pay for their education and then they obligate or they ask them to come back and give us three, four, five years of service based on the investment that we made in you. Because sometimes some of our best workers and our, and our, and our best uh, and faithful members go away and they don't come back. And now we're left with the people who really never did much. Am I the only one that's, that's found that? Some of your, your better workers uh, get relocated and they go to other parts of the country and all of that. And then you discover uh, these people who are left with you are people who don't really want to do anything but come to church services. Question. How strong will your congregation be in 10 years? You know where you are right now, uh, but in 10 years, how strong is your congregation going to be? That's something to ponder, it's something to think about. And we need to think about it now so we can put in place the things that are going to help our congregation to thrive. And it starts now. Training and mentoring and developing people. Training and mentoring the people even in your home. Uh, my family, Lynn, Sebastian, and I, we are, we are a ministry family. We serve in the congregation. Sebastian is our lead song leader. Uh, Lynn leads our men, women's ministry. Uh, and she's an excellent Bible class teacher. And what we been have been trying to do is show families in the church the joy of ministering together. And to recognize it's easy to do when everybody in the family is supportive of this. Not just a husband and wife, but when mom, dad, husband, wife, and children are involved. But you, you can't start that when your children are 15, 16, 17 year old. You gotta start that earlier. And you can't do that if you're not married to somebody who's as strong in the faith as you are. So one of the things that we've been doing at our congregation is really working on uh, mentoring men to be better fathers and husbands. Because one of the things I'm seeing is that that's where a lot of our men struggle. Uh, they're married to good women who won't call them out, but they're frustrated. Uh, I did a class this Wednesday at our congregation on uh, when a wife's fed up. And I am quite sure uh, at all of the congregations here, you have wives who love the Lord, who are doing their best to be faithful and consistent and supportive of the husbands, who feel unappreciated, who is trying to encourage him to be the man of God uh, that he ought to be, but he has divided loyalty because of job, because of professional pursuits, because of hobbies. Where will your congregation be in 10 years? Since I've been here in New England, New England, several congregations have folded. Some of them because of lack of membership, some of them because of splits. And there are not that many congregations up here for us to be losing some. We got congregations up here that don't have any ministers. And, and so you have brothers rotating the preaching. 
that's fine, but what happens if the brothers really are not that good teachers? What's, what's this going to say to the, the members of the congregation? And I just simply raise these issues to just remind us that if we're going to um, have strong families, if we're going to have strong congregations, if we're going to be able to leave a mark on those left behind, we got to start thinking about it now. Because tomorrow is not promised to any of us. You're strong and healthy today. Uh, most of us are going to drive back home uh, tomorrow. Somebody's going to drive you back home. Uh, there's no guarantee you're going to get back home. Some of you have already started planning your Sunday sermons and all that kind of stuff. That's fine, but there's no guarantee you're going to preach on Sunday. So if you couldn't preach on Sunday, is there, uh, is there somebody in place now who can get up and, and bring the lesson on Sunday? If you are a Bible school teacher, if you couldn't be there on Sunday, is there somebody who's going to teach a class? Somebody you'd be comfortable with teaching a class? Okay, my time is up. Uh, I hope, uh, you know, I've said some things to spur your thinking. Uh, I know we're getting ready to go into free time. I'm going to be down front. Uh, please come down and talk to me. And then we have another session uh, tonight at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, I forgot. I created handouts for you guys. I didn't give them out to you. And so if you want them, just come on down and get them uh, when we finish. Um, thank you guys for listening.